Hey there, I'm Mike Gillette, your host, and this is the Soundscape Series 1937 Part 12, Episode 44 of When Radio Ruled. This podcast is a montage of excerpts from old-time radio shows performed live and broadcast June 13 to June 20th, 1937. Starring Pinky Tomlin, Donna Michi, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, Dorothy Lamour, W.C. Fields, Joan Blondell, Rogers and Hart, Jack Benny, Don Wilson, Kenny Baker, Phil Harris, Cecil B. DeMille, Helen Wills Moody, Fibber McGee and Molly, Rudy Valley, Fanny Bryce, Charles Winninger, May Robeson, and more. Featured songs include Pinky Tomlin, Ragtime Cowboy Joe Medley, Don Amici, A Little of You on Toast, Rudy Valley, We Dance the Night Away. These soundscapes are a result of the research phase of the When Radio Ruled historical documentary series. In order to find the best old-time radio excerpts to express the essence of the era, I listened to hundreds of hours of old-time radio broadcasts, looking for the most interesting bits. When I hear something outstanding, a song, or a joke, or a comedy sketch, a news report, or an interview, I add it to a best of clip reel, so I can easily find all the best excerpts when creating the documentary. But not everything can get in the final version. For 1937, I boiled 6.3 days of programming down to 27 hours of excerpts from which a little under 5 hours made the final cut. And it seems like such a waste. Listening to these clip reels is one of my favorite parts of the process. I don't remember what I put on each reel, so they contain one unexpected gem after another. And I want to share that experience with you. These excerpts are offered without commentary for your entertainment and education. So here are voices from 1937. Voices sadly now silenced. Great performers living again because you're listening to them perform live now. When he shoots his gun, cause those western folks all know. Well, he's a highfalutin' rabbit shooting son of a gun from Oklahoma. He's some cowboy, talk about your cowboy, ragtime cowboy Joe. Who give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the And the skies are not cloudy all day. Carry me back, carry me back to the long prairie, the long prairie, where the coyotes howl oh, and the wind blows free. Wind. And when I die, you're never gonna die. You can bury me. Bury you where? Neath the western sky. Right away out there. On the long prairie. On that long prairie. Going with the wind. His top hat clamped on his red head and his monocle screwed in his right eye. Charlie McCarthy is about two jumps ahead of the truant officer and only two and a half jumps ahead of a spanking. But nobody'd risk hand spanking Charlie, even if he is made of soft pine. But it's a safe bet Edgar Bergen could talk Charlie out of any kind of trouble because it's really Edgar who puts the words in Charlie's mouth. I uh, hope, Edgar, that you have cleared everything with the truant officer and that you have enrolled Charlie in the school. Well, it's not as simple as all that, Don. No, it isn't. No. 
for it. I've had another letter from Mr. Ramshackle, the truant officer. And he's liable to arrive here and get Charlie any minute. <laughs> well, he'll have some time to get me because I've locked all the doors around here and I've swallowed the keys. Oh, I see. <laughs> if he does show up, I'm going to take the air route out of here. The air route? Yeah. What do you mean? I'm leaving through the ventilator. I see. <laughs> well, now, listen, young man. Uh-huh. I am i don't want to be any part of this. No. No, listen. You're only cheating yourself out of an education. Is that so? Yes. Now, don't count on me for protection, for I'm not going to be a part of this scheme of yours. Oh, is that so? No. Well, suppose I do go to school. Suppose I do. So what? Well, it means a great deal to have your name read Charlie McCarthy, LLD, or PhD. Yes. Now, it's up to you how it's going to read. Yes. Well, I like Charlie McCarthy, RSD. RM. <laughs> For that matter, I've already had a title of MD. MD? Yeah, mental deficient. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, you're all right, Charlie. I think so, yes. yes. <laughs> there are just a few wheels out of order up here in your head. Uh, well, I'll keep my hat on. It won't show. No. <laughs> but, young man, you can't hide ignorance. No. No. Every time you speak, you reveal your knowledge or your lack of knowledge. Is that so? Yes. For example, if a man should come up to you and say, will you borrow me $10? Yes. What do you think of that? Very little. Very little. Yeah. <laughs> you know he lacks education. Yes. Why? Well, if he had any sense at all, he'd know I didn't have 10 bucks. I see. <laughs> now, if he should say, can you loan me $10? What's the difference? There's no difference at all. <laughs> I'm still broke. I see. <laughs> at school, I was known as a three-letter man. I owe you. I see. <laughs> <laughs> a shameful record. Is that so? Yes. Uh, what, uh, what kind of a student were you, Mr. Bergen? Well, in all my school years, I can boast of a record of never having failed in any subject. Yeah? Can you say the same? Well, uh, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> but not with such a straight face. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't understand schooling. Mm. I don't know if I don't go to school, the truant officer comes after me. And if I do go, they flunk me out. Yeah. <laughs> Life is complicated, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's so complicated that I think if a person is lucky, if he isn't born at all. Of course, that seldom happens. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do, gentlemen? Can you tell me where I could find Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy? Uh, yes. Us is them. I mean, we's of those. Uh, I'm it. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, look. Which one is which? Well, that's him, and I'm me. <laughs> well, wh which one is a stupid one? Well, there's been a good deal of discussion about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to talk to you if I'm not intruding. Oh, not at all. Come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. Uh, thank you, thank you. I am Mr. Ramshackle, the truant officer. Oh, what? get out, get out, get out, get out. Don't you dare to interrupt us here. Oh, so you're Charlie McCarthy, hmm? No, no, not me. My name is Exo Carlson. I just came over here three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Now, look, you can't fool me, McCarthy. Why don't you tell the truth? Why don't you blow your nose? Oh. <laughs> I guess you don't know what I'm here for, hmm? Uh, well, what are you going to do, Mr. Ramshackle? And there's only one road for me to take. Why don't you take it? <laughs> you take the high road and I'll take the alley. All right. That boy must come with me. I'll go, but if you take me away from Bergen, I'll never say another word. <laughs> <laughs> That boy is sadly in need of schooling. Mm -hmm. That is shown by his marks forwarded from New York. That's they right. read D in spelling, D in arithmetic, D in deportment, and D in effort. Uh, I was fresh out of effort. Yeah. <laughs> There's very little to be said for that. Nothing but D's. Very little to be said for that. Well, at least I'm consistent. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, but it doesn't read very well. D, 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 D. Uh, it sounds better if you sing it. D, 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 D. <laughs> Bum, 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 here we are. Hey, nanny, nanny, and a bum, bum, bum. Take it away, Nietzsche. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to present a one-act dramatic epic entitled Summer. 
Conceived, written, produced, and directed by Charles McCarthy. Starring C. McCarthy, one of the matinee idols of the American stage, and featuring Dorothy Limp Moore, an actress. Scenery designed, painted, and created by Senor Carlos McCarthy. Shrubbery and landscaping is in McCarthy Park, the courtesy of McCarthy Planters Incorporated. Incidental music composed by Charles and McCarthy. It is a hot day in July. The female, Dorothy Lamour. <laughs> the handsome and debonair tar, Charlie McCarthy. Curtain. Oh, summer. Ah, uh, summer. Oh, summer. What is so hot as a day in July? Hello? Hello. Ain't it hot? You said it, babe. <laughs> It was hotter last night, wasn't it? Mm, you said it, babe. And how? <laughs> Are you a poet, sailor? No, I'm a sailor poet. Oh, I love ships in the summer. What ship are you often? I'm often, yes, 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 McCarthy. Often on it. <laughs> oh, I love the sea. Especially in the summer, don't you? Don't mind if I do, no. <laughs> Have you ever been to sea? To see what? Oh, skip it, landlubber. <laughs> <laughs> then you are a sailor, ain't you? Yes, and how? Oh, standing on the deck and letting the salt spray hit you in the mug. Ah, uh, and boy, do I get seasick. <laughs> You're nice, you know it. Sure, I'm especially nice in summer. Summer, a voice is calling. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? Oh, I just love weather. And I love you. Oh, you sailors. I bet you got a sweetheart in every port. No, not in summer. I don't do so good in summer. <laughs> then I love you. Mind if I sit down on a bench with you? There ain't really room enough for two on this bench, sailor. Mm. Mind if I sit on your lap just because it's summer? <laughs> but I don't even know your name. I'll tell you after I sit on your lap. <laughs> what song is that the orchestra is playing? I don't hear no orchestra. Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> Must be the music in my soul. I always have music in my soul in summer. <laughs> summer voice is calling. <laughs> You're the nicest man I ever met in the Navy in the summer. Have you any friends on the ship? Oh, gobs and gobs and gobs. <laughs> Say, girl, how about stepping out for a fast little Lindy Hop at McCarthy's Dance Palace? You ain't asking me really to go, are you? Well, that was the general idea. <laughs> Gosh, I love to dance in the summer. But McCarthy charges a dollar for men. Yeah? Have you got a dollar? <laughs> Wait, I'll look. Better look for a dollar and a quarter. I may need lunch money. <laughs> I just got a dollar and 25 cents. Lucky for us, McCarthy lets ladies in free. Yeah, I'll tell you what you do. What we'll do now. You go in and dance, and I'll wait for you outside. Uh, let me hold the money. <laughs> oh, you're so thoughtful. Yeah. Let's go. Oh, summer. Summer beautiful and summer dumb. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Say, look. Look at what? A... Look at my dress. It's got stripes all over it. Oh, gosh, I can't go. Yeah, look at my sailor suit. Looking like ex-convict. <laughs> That's summer for you. Summer? Yeah, it never fails. They always paint those park benches in summer. Ain't winter wonderful? Oh, winter. Ah, uh, yes, indeed, winter. <laughs> And for Miss Lamore and myself, thank you. The Chase and Sanborn Hour and Don Amici may now continue. <laughs> oh, Rollo, you're marvelous. You know, you're wonderful. Yeah, I know it. He admits it. <laughs> uh, let me introduce myself, Rollo. I know. Uh, you're Charlie McCarthy. You said Redwood Four knows. Oh, boy, some knows. <laughs> what a combination. Poison ivy and blood poison. <laughs> Why does everyone take an average delight in running down my nose, huh? There's enough room to run up and down your nose. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, <laughs> and there's a society for the prevention of cruelty to children. Come on, Rollo. 
Let's gang up on him. You clip him and I'll mow him down. Yeah, come on. Let's get him. Uh, you keep out of this or I'll pull off one of Charlie's legs and beat your brains out. Don't be afraid, Raul. We're going to lick him. No way, McCarthy. I'll prune every twig off your body. <laughs> Don't you really like children, Bill? Sure, I like them. If they're properly cooked. <laughs> browned on one side. Now, remember, Rollo, you'll be a good boy and you'll grow up to be just like Mr. Field. Oh, I didn't do nothing. Oh, don't cry, Rollo. Oh. Uncle Willie will bring you a nice little uh, bunny rabbit. And an open-faced razor, too. Goody, goody. Goody, goody. Good, good. He didn't eat right. And will you bring me a nice little necktie for my nice little Nicky? Yes, I'll also bring you a little scrub and brushy for your necky. <laughs> that kid ever wash his neck? I don't know, Bill. I've only had him with me for three and a half months. I thought he smelled rather fragrant. <laughs> uh, what are you going to bring me, Mr. Fields? I'll bring you a wooden leg. Huh? You'll need it because I'm going to break this one. These kids are driving me to drink. Why, Bill, I read in a book once that liquor deteriorates the brain. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Joan. My father drank liquor and was the most one of the most alert men until the very day he died. Is that yes, so, Bill? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Had one of those hair-trigger brains, you know. Binge, 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 binge. <laughs> Well, now, I bet he drank a case of whiskey, all in moderation, of course. <laughs> Mine was just as clear and keen as a buggy whip. He must have been a marvelous man, Bill. Oh, yes. My Peter Noster was a marvelous man. He once went up in a balloon to accompany a lonesome parachute jumper. He got up 10,000 feet in the air. Go on, Bill. This is excruciatingly interesting. Yes, it was cold up there. My father was cold and stiff. I know he was cold. <laughs> uh, he was stiff before he went up, though. <laughs> Father let go of the parachute. He took a chance of landing on a load of hay. Well, did he land on the load of hay, Bill? Uh, no, Don. He landed in a cement mixer. Was your father hurt? Yeah, no. How can a man get hurt jumping 5,000 feet into a cement mixer? What's the matter with I that I think we better get these kids out of here, Don. I'll find out. Before any further destruction takes place, come, Rollo, come, John. I'll have a wild Thank you, Mr. John Mondell, and thank you very much, WCP. <laughs> Mr. Nietzsche, may I bend your ear for a minute? Why, what's on your mind, Charlie? Well, I would a word or two or three or two with you and Dick <laughs> Rogers and Larry Hart. Well, you know, that's strange. They expressed a desire to meet you. Yeah, what's well, strange about that? Everybody does. Oh, Mrs. Rogers and Hart. Yes, Charlie. Charlie, my boy. I'm glad to have this chance to have a talk with you two boys. You know, after all, we have much in common. I, too, write songs. You do? Yes. Yes, I do. I don't sell any, but I write them. You write the music, too? Oh, but definitely. I write music that can't even be played. <laughs> That's remarkable. What's the name of your latest composition? Well, I just dashed off a little hink of a ditty for the masses, you know. I call it, uh, I call it, uh, a little of you on toast. That's strange, Charlie. We've just finished a song for Don Amici called A Little of You on Toast. Yeah. Oh, you have, huh? Something wrong here, something, eh? <laughs> a little toast, huh? Yes, a little of you on toast. That's right. Some crust. <laughs> yes. It's very embarrassing because we've copyrighted the song. Oh, you have? Ah. Uh, well, there are two ways of doing business, of course. That kind of money will never do you any good, you know that. You sure yours was called a little of you on toast? Well, yes. Uh, maybe first I called it uh, a lot of me on a hunk of whole wheat, I think. <laughs> I don't know. I'm afraid someone's mistaken. Well, after all, none of us are human. None of us is uh, human. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, right. Ted. Yes. Uh, now, where were we? <laughs> Father, but just a coincidence, the same thing happened to me a few years ago. A couple of mugs came out with a song I wrote called uh, My Heart Stood Still. <laughs> we were the mugs who wrote that song, Charlie. Oh, you are, huh? Well, I don't have to ask you boys where you get your material, do I? <laughs> Are you sure yours was also called My Heart Stood Still? Well, roughly, yes. And then again, 
I think I called it mine was I Dropped Dead, something like that. Same idea, of course. <laughs> what kind of melody did you have for your song, Charlie? Was it good? Good? Well, it was good enough for Mendelssohn. I guess it was good enough for me. <laughs> Where do you get yours, boys? We like Mendelssohn, too. Yeah? Charlie, you're a genius. And yeah. since you claim plagiarism, we'll agree to avoid a lawsuit by declaring you in on the song. Oh, fine. Declare Bergen in, too. We guys, we work together, you know. Rogers, Hart, Bergen, and McCarthy, huh? It's an awful lot of names to put on one song, don't you think? Well, it's an awful big firm. <laughs> I think three days might look better. Well, now, maybe you're right. Let me see. Do we need Rogers? Oh, uh, wait a minute, Charlie. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's finagling. Yeah. I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll leave out Bergen. That'll burn him up. <laughs> I'll plug the song, too. I'll sing it now, and by tomorrow, it'll be up in the first ten. Oh, boy, the first ten. Yeah, and the first ten wastebaskets of Hollywood. <laughs> I trust you, Charlie. But since our version was written for Don to sing, suppose we let him start it off. Okay, with me. I'll top that, Don. Go ahead, Don. Hey, I'd like to crowd a couple of words in here to thank Dick and Larry for giving me the pleasure of launching their song. Dick's at the piano to help you launch it, Don. Yeah, and after me, she's got it launched, I'll sink it. <laughs> bon voyage, Werner. <laughs> Silver lining, if I am your main 
your smile is sunshine, your charms are well designed, darling, if you don't mind, I'll take a little on cold. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and thanks, Don, thanks very much for the compliment, if it was. Well, Jack, I couldn't help observing how rapidly you've improved since your illness. Really, it's amazing. Oh, there's nothing unusual about it, Don. We Bennies are a sturdy family. You know, very unlollipoppy. <laughs> Ah, oh, yes, Jack, you certainly are the picture of health. I feel good, too, and you know what's been doing it, don't you? Plenty of fresh air and exercise. Well, that's news to me. Do you really go in for exercise? Oh, passionately. <laughs> <laughs> Why, I'm on my third rowing machine. <laughs> By the way, Don, when, uh, where are the uh, next Olympic Games? Mm, in Japan in 1940. Gee, I wish they were sooner. <laughs> You know, Jack, I had no idea you were such an athlete. Oh, yes, yes. Well, tell me, Jack, uh, just what is your formula in the pursuit of muscular stimulation? Well, I, uh, uh what was that, Don? I say, what do you do for exercise? Oh. 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 <laughs> well, Don, the first thing in the morning, I fling back the covers and jump out of bed. Uh, then I do my breathing exercises. What's that? I smell my breakfast. <laughs> Uh, by that time, I'm ready for my, uh... Oh, hello, Kenny. Hello, Jack. What are you fellas talking about? Exercises that have been building him up. Oh, exercises. I trainers. You have? Uh, what does he do for you, Kenny? Oh, he takes me for a run through the park, and then he makes me jump through hoops, and after that, he makes me balance a ball on my nose. <laughs> but, Kenny, you've got an animal trainer. What? An animal trainer. Well, he certainly did wonders for me. <laughs> he did, huh? You should see me bury a bone. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny, you're positively silly. Oh, yeah? Well, I've got a smart brother, and he's starving to death. Oh. <laughs> well, well, I surrender. Well, to show you my heart's in the right place, I'll buy you a present next week that'll make up for everything. Yeah, well, get me something I can nail down. <laughs> or at least something I can eat. All right, I'll get you a plunk steak. That's plank. No, it's plunk. I'm going to hit you over the head with it. <laughs> Fine friend. Phil, you're the kind of a guy who could split up Damon and Pythias. Are they still running around together? <laughs> I don't know. I missed Winchell's broadcast. <laughs> I wish somebody would knock on the door or something. What a coincidence. Tonight's play conter concerns one type of court. Now we hear from a young woman who's made history on another kind. Seven times Wimbledon tennis champion, seven times United States champion, and four times champion of France. An, un an unequal record. Helen Wills Moody, as one of the greatest of all women athletes. I introduce her tonight with the hope that she'll settle a question in the mind of everyone who follows this sport of king and commoner. Mrs. Moody, have you given up tournament tennis for good, or is there a chance you'll return? I should like to go on one more tour which would include Wimbledon and Forest Hills. It's difficult, however, to leave home for such a long time as is required for the summer tournaments. But there is something irresistible about tennis, and I find myself playing regularly at home in San Francisco four or five times a week. In a few days, the matches will begin at Wimbledon. That must be rather a hard call for you to resist. Indeed it is, but after all, it isn't Wimbledon or championships that make tennis such a grand game. It's the finest sport in the world because it's everybody's game, a sport for all ages. When I was in Stockholm, I played with King Gustav of Sweden, who's still on the courts in his late 70s. Here in Hollywood, you'll find many of the stars playing remarkably well, not only for exercise, but because they know tennis develops poise. Among them are stars like Earl Flynn, Clark Gable, Gilbert Rowland, Warner Baxter, Greta Garbo, Ronald Coleman, and Merle Oberon. I understand that now you're devoting a lot of time to designing clothes and painting. How does an artist's brush feel in a hand accustomed to a tennis racket? The fields are not so far removed as you may think, Mr. DeMille. The action of a tennis game, the sweep of the strokes, the graceful lines, the rhythm of motion are qualities that lend themselves very readily to an etching or a pencil sketch. 
Look at a good painting, and then in a good game of tennis, and you'll find a kindred artistry. As for clothes, my interest in designing was stimulated when I once found myself with a match on my hands, but no outfit. I was in a large city and yet couldn't find a store that had sensible sport clothes. Most of my designs have been for active sportwear, but I have also done some bathing suits and street dresses. Since I've been doing this designing work, my attention has been called to the problem of keeping up the attractiveness of sportwear, and I know that the answer has been found in the use of Lux Flakes. Sportwear lasts longer, looks better, and stays fresher when cared for with a splendid product responsible for this program. It's obvious, Mrs. Moody, that you believe in having a variety of interests. Yes, I believe if you have one main interest and a variety of lesser interests, it makes for greater happiness. In proof of which, I've also tried my hand at writing, and I've just completed a book. I've called it 15 to 30, because it deals not only with tennis, but with the experiences I've had and what I hope I've learned during those, year- during those years. All my thanks, Mr. DeMille, for asking me to appear in the Lux Radio Theater. Hmm. I'm sure you'll be a champion among authors, too. Days you and your fishing. Don't scoff at my fishing, madam. I used to be the champion fin finagler of Pittsburgh. Mm. Paul Toter McGee, I was known as in one day. Oh, my. Paul Toter McGee, the peak of piscatorial perfection, persistently presumed pike, pickle, and pretty perch from pool to pool, and paddling through every possible puddle and pond from Puxatawney to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Hi ho, everybody. This is Rudy Valley and Company. The hilarious Fanny Bryce. The Orchidaceous, Tallulah Bankhead, the droll Joe Laurie. There's a trio that you can count on for a good time. Fanny brings her little hellcat, Baby Snooks, to an eastern microphone for the last time before leaving for Hollywood on a new screen contract. Tallulah will be heard in a new play by Dorothy Parker. And Joe continues on his novel way for the fourth consecutive week. In addition to these professional entertainers, we have with us an amateur of high standing in the community. If uh, if we were betting any money on who was going to play Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind, our wager would go down on Tallulah Bankhead. That's not a tip, it's just a strong hunch. Based on the fact that movie producers occasionally show good sense nowadays. She taught me the meaning of we we sherry, so we danced the night away from the Montmartre to the quay. How we sang the Marseille. She was Mademoiselle for Marmontier, and I was the Duke of the Rue de la Paix. I met her in Paris at the Cafe du Dome. She was such fun, and I was so far from home. She's only a Yankee. From Gulf, Tennessee, now she sherries to me. Snooks, tell me, what do you have to do for homework today? A composition. A composition? You have to write a composition on what? On how I spent the day at home. Well, let me see what you wrote. Here, Daddy. 
This is a composition on how you spent the day? Why, it's a blank sheet of paper with nothing on it. Well, I didn't do nothing all day. Snooks, why did you spend the whole day doing nothing? Because I wanted to be a good little girl. I don't understand that at all. You could be a good little girl and still do something. No, I can't. Why not? Because every time I do something, something breaks. Well, you can't hand in a blank piece of paper for your composition. Now, you tell me all the things you did today. I'll write them down on the composition, and then you can copy it. Mm. <laughs> Mommy will have to copy it. Why should Mother have to copy my composition for you? Because the teacher thinks that's my handwriting. Snooks, you have no pride in your education. I'm ashamed of the way Mother and I have to do your schoolwork for you. Snooks, I suffer a great deal because of you. Well, I suffer on account of you, too, Daddy. Why? Because all the examples you do for me is wrong. Right. Let's not go into that, Snooks. Now we'll start the composition. You dictate, and I'll write. Now, how did you spend the day at home? Yeah. I... Must I tell a truth? Well, of course, nothing but the truth. All right. I woke up in the morning. I'm happy. Didn't you wash your face? No, nope, I saved it from yesterday. Well, I think you better say you washed. Well, it ain't the truth. Pick a day when you did wash. The teacher wants it from this week. I'll take that up with you later, Snooks. Now go on with your composition. What did you do after breakfast? I waited, and I waited, and I waited. You waited for what? For lunch. What did you do after lunch? I waited some more. What for? Your dinner? No, for my four o'clock milk. You can't write a composition just about eating all day. Who can? You! <laughs> you should tell something about what happened. All right. Daddy and Mommy was fighting all day. Now, just a minute. You can't write a thing like that. Because you'll give the wrong impression. You'll make people think your parents fight all the time. And you know that Daddy loves Mommy. Not today. He didn't. <laughs> that was a very special case about a new dress your mother bought. Let's continue with the composition. And remember, you can't say Daddy was fighting with Mommy. All right. Mommy was fighting with Daddy all day. I won't allow it. You mustn't write a thing like that. All right. Then you write the composition. All right. After breakfast, I rode on a nice new horsey Daddy bought me. What horsey? Now, Snooks, it's just a make-believe horsey for the composition. Now, after you rode on the horsey, what happened? Daddy was fighting with Mommy all day. What? Yeah, throwing dishes. Now, you know that's not true. What dishes? Just make-believe dishes for the composition. Snooks, I don't want you to mention Daddy or Mommy again in connection with your composition. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Now, what happened after breakfast? A lady and a man was fighting all day. I don't want to hear any more about that fight. Just tell me what happened to you. Huh? Weren't you sent on some errand? Didn't you do something? Oh, yeah. Mommy sent me to the grocery store. Mommy sent it you? Yeah, and I went it. Sent it and went it. What kind of talk is that? When you're writing a composition, you can't talk like that. You must use your very best English. All right. Now dictate it exactly as you want me to write it in the composition in your very best English. All right. After breakfast, I is went to the grocery store. No, no, you can't say that. Don't you know anything about tense? Is is the present tense, was is the past tense. Oh, I was went to the grocery store. No, no, the correct thing to say is I went to the grocery store. You didn't, I went. I know you went, but the right thing to say is I went, understand? Did we both went? No, 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 I didn't go, you went. Now say it. You went. Not you went, I went. That's what I said, you went. When I say I went, I don't mean I went, I mean you went. <laughs> Do you feel all right, Daddy? I feel as well as I can under the circumstances. Now, let's go on with the composition. All right. Now, what happened after you returned from the grocery store? Well, Daddy and Mommy... Max! I told you not to mention that again. Well, I don't like the composition. Now, this is too much. Snooks, you're a very naughty girl, and you're backward in your schoolwork. There's only one way I can see any hope for you. You'll have to pray to the angels every night to make you a good girl. I pray to the angels, Daddy. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Did you pray last night? Mm-hmm. But it's no use. What do you mean, it's no use? The angels didn't listen to me. You prayed to the angels last night and they didn't listen to you? Mm-hmm. How?
do you know they didn't listen to you? Because today the school was still open. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, as a little surprise, I'd like to introduce another very dear friend of mine who happens to be up here tonight. A personality whom I know you will be glad to hear is returning to the air in his original role of Captain Henry of the Maxwell House Showboat. Ladies and gentlemen, Charlie Winninger. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Charlie, I'm happy to hear you're coming back on the showboat program. Uh, When do you take over the helm? On July 8th. July 8th, huh? Yes, sir. We're going to truck on down the Mississippi. Well, tell me, Charlie. Oh, pardon me. Uh, what kind of a show are you going to put on for the folks? Well, now, it's going to be the same old showboat with a brand new crew. It is, huh? Yep. You know, Jack, I'll be mighty happy to greet all my... I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'll be mighty happy to greet all my old friends. Yeah, say, Charlie, you know my gang here, don't you? Don oh, Wilson, sure, sure. Bill Harris, and yeah. this is Mary Livingston. Oh, hello, Mary. You're a mighty pretty gal. Thank you. Well, Captain, how about taking me for a ride? Mary, that's Captain Henry of Showboat. Oh, I thought he had a yacht. <laughs> don't pay any attention to her, Charlie. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlie, Charlie, this is our tenor, Kenny Baker. Oh, hello. Glad to know you, Kenny. Hello. Kenny, you remember Charlie Winninger. He was in that picture, Three Smart Girls. Which one was he? (laughs) Now, Kenny, cut it out. Oh, it's all right, Jack. I like the little brat. (laughs) Well, Charlie, I want to thank you for coming up here tonight. I'm tickled to death you dropped in, and I want to wish you continued success in many happy dockings of showboat. Well, thank you, Jack, and I hope all my old friends will be listening in on July 8th. Oh, uh, Captain Henry, you want to hear something? Uh, what is it, Mary? Uh, dear old father, dear old father, how I love you. Oh, Say your good friend. night, folks. Good night. J-E-L-L-O. Look for the new showboat program with Charles Winninger as Captain Henry with the comedy of Jack Haley... The singing of Nadine Connor, Thomas Thomas, and Virginia Barrel, with Warren Hall and the music of Meredith Wilson. Remember the date, July 8th. The Jell-O program comes to you from Hollywood over the red network of the National Broadcasting Company. Charlie McCarthy's days of playing hooky are over. Even though Edgar Bergen is around to give voice to Charlie's excuses, down must go the bitter pill of knowledge. So, Edgar, in the interest of Charlie's education, I have asked Mademoiselle Fifi Pomme de Terre to tutor him in languages. I hope she helps him. That's nice of you, Don. I hope Charlie appreciates your efforts in his behalf. That's that. Oh, I do, I do. Yeah. I only wish him each he'd mind his own P's and Q's and X's, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Mademoiselle Pomme de Terre, this is Charlie McCarthy. Oh, bonjour, Charlot. Oh, il est bien gentil, ce petit bonhomme. Oh, oui, très charmant. All right, all right, all right, now. Mademoiselle, are you Amici's friend or are you my tutor? But certainement, I am your tutor. Well, then, start putting. <laughs> what language do you want to learn? French? Yes? No? Huh? Well, I, uh, I, uh... I think that would be very good. He will learn French. Yeah. Didn't take me long to decide, did it? <laughs> Charlotte, uh-huh. Mr. Bergin, he is your father. Bergin, my father? Oh, no. Things aren't as bad as all that. <laughs> no, you see, Charlie is an orphan. Yes, I am. Yes. As a matter of fact, I know very little about his parents, you understand? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I found him on the doorstep one morning when he was two days old. Yes. How I got there, I'll never be able to figure out. <laughs> what a night that was. <laughs> It was the gypsy in me, I imagine so. Yeah. On a doorstep and only two days old. Yeah, and stealing milk, too. Yo. <laughs> Pretty damn they steal. Je suis, je suis. <laughs> Monsieur, do you know anything about the beautiful country of France? Well, uh, yes. Uh, three years ago, come this uh, what may, <laughs> I, um, I visited the continent. Uh, I became rather clubby with a baroness. I met her at a spa. Oh, what spa? Ernest Bob. <laughs> you beg for it. <laughs> Have you been to Paris? Yes, no. Oh, yes, no, yes. I spent three days in Paris. Oh, Paris in the spring. 
chestnuts in the bois. And that champ felt him. Oh. Oh, yes. The Champs-Élysées is beautiful. Yes, that too. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> but, Charlie, you can't see Paris in three days. No, I found that out. <laughs> I didn't have time to see the things I shouldn't see. <laughs> but what fun. Yes. Those were the days. Yes, and the nights weren't so bad either. <laughs> Where did you go? Well, the first night I went to the Follet Berger. Mm-hmm. And the second night? Uh, the second night, uh, the Follet Berger. I, I do everything thoroughly. <laughs> and the third night? Well, I didn't have anything to do, so I went to the Follet Berger. Ah, <laughs> oh, but did you see the paintings of the great masters at the Louvre? Oh, what etching. Yes. And the monkeys in the zoo, what scratching. <laughs> That's one of the old chestnuts in the bois. Yes. <laughs> yes. Did you visit the Louvre, Charlie? Uh, well, my dear Mr. Bergen, if you ever visit the Louvre, you'll never forget it. No. Oh, it's so impressive. <laughs> it's so impressive. <laughs> but did you visit the Louvre? Well, I remember one morning after breakfast, passing that impressive building, and I said to myself, that's the Louvre, yes. There hangs the work of the great masters. But did you visit the Louvre? I was, uh, well, did you? Uh, well, I did. Uh, no. I... <laughs> <laughs> not actually. I see. I hate myself for not having done it. Yes. <laughs> oh, how cute. Yes, tray, tray cute. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell me, what do you know about the French language? Well, all I know is that garçon means taxi, and I'm not even sure of that. No. <laughs> You study with me and I will make you speak French. Yeah. How much a lesson, mademoiselle? Oh, I teach Parisian French. You speak through the nose for five dollars a lesson. Yeah. You're going to make me pay for the nose, too, aren't you? <laughs> but not only the French language will I teach you, but the history of France. Ah. I will tell you about Napoleon. Napoleon. Jean d'Arc. Oh. And Louis XIV. Louis XIV? <laughs> what? was that? She means Louis Fourteenth. Why didn't she say so? She's going to teach me French, and she can't even speak English. <laughs> Louis XIV, well, we got one of his tables here. Bought it from him, yeah. Hasn't got a straight leg on it, no. <laughs> I think they got rheumatism. Yeah. We got a picture with uh, a chevalier lip on it. <laughs> All right. Uh, I... See, I want to know, how, how do you say, may I kiss you, in French? Ah, uh... uh-huh, that is the subject of the sixth lesson. Oh, it is, huh? Let's skip the first five, huh? <laughs> oh, Monsieur Shallow. No, 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 no. Oh, wee, 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 wee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Here we are. There are fairies in the bottom of my swimming pool. <laughs> oh, hello, Miss Robson. Hello. How are you, Charlie? Oh, I'm fine. I want, I want to tell you how wonderful I think you are. That finesse of your performance, your savoir faire, that tray, tray, tremendous. <laughs> But definitely, too. <laughs> oh, thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, young man. And I consider it a great compliment. You're a mighty fine little lad. And you have the makings of a great man. Well, that's what I told Bergen. Eh? <laughs> but he said I should study. Eh? Ah, Mr. Bergen is right, my son. Mother. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you must study and share the thoughts of great minds. Nothing is more profitable than spending an evening with a good book. Yes, well, I don't know. You see, I have two ducats for the fight tonight. I suppose that's wrong, isn't it? Of course it's wrong. Very wrong. Why don't you wait until Tuesday night and see a good scrap? Oh. (laughs) Yes. But you don't understand. Tonight, the Pomona assassin headlines the evening event. He's a killer. Oh, don't tell me about that, Tomata. Hmm? He's a sucker for a left hook with that glass jaw. Oh. <laughs> Why, that palooka couldn't last two round shadow streak. <laughs> oh, now, come, come, come. That's just where you're wrong, sister. That baby packed a lethal wallop in both of those meat hooks of his. Why, he'll go the distance and he'll win tonight. Well, I've got a buck says he winds up with resin in his teeth before the third scratch. You're talking pin money, babe. Pin money. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I'll call you. And if Pomona Assassin doesn't KO Tony McSnurd, seal his lamps, and trim his wicks, I'll pay off with the best spot in town tonight. The hottest spot in town. Uh Uh-huh. You're on. All right, sonny boy. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute now. Name the spot. Well, have you heard stuffed fish down at the broken door? <laughs> that boy scratches a mean hunk of fiddle. Oh, you call that hot? Yeah. <laughs> 
Give me Brother Mark Zambo. Now, there's a cat who's really mellow. Yeah? Does does he really give out with a la-di-da, la-di-da? Oh, oh, sir, that went out with the cakewalk. What? Huh? Blubber gives out the ho dee do and a ho dee do Cat gets cat and a rat me cat. I think you got something there, Mom. <laughs> Can you truck, Grandma? Truck? <laughs> What's the matter with you? You think I'm getting old? Say, huh? how about the Susie Q? Woody! The studying's all for tonight. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Charlie. Huh? Perhaps we shouldn't do this. I'm worried. Oh, don't worry, Muzzy May. Don't worry. I'll see that you get home safe by, uh, with me tonight, you know. La-di-da, la-di-da. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Don, you know this is Father's Day? Yes. You know my father was a doctor? <laughs> yes, he treated a man for three years for yellow jaundice. <laughs> then found out he was a Chinaman. <laughs> Mr. Fields, I read in a paper where you consume two quarts of liquor a day. <laughs> what would your father think about that? He'd think I was a sissy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll squeeze every drop of our wood alcohol out of your body. <laughs> Bill, Bill, you should be kind. Remember, this is Father's Day. Uh, it was always Father's Day in our home, Don. Oh, it was, huh? Uh, it was never Mother's Day or Grandmother's Day. Uh-huh. Was always eating apple a day. Oh, yes, Bill, I see. Father would never eat an apple, Don. He always preferred the juice of that succulent pippin. <laughs> Isn't it peculiar, Don? Every time Father asked for an apple, he would always refer to everyone as Jack. Well, what do you mean, Bill? <laughs> He'd always say, give me a little apple, Jack. <laughs> Sweet joke, don't you think so, Don? Yeah, uh, yeah sure. But, Bill, uh, you were just saying this is Father's Day. Oh, yes, I know. Everybody was talking about Father today. The air will be just glutted up with eulogies of paper. There were many beautiful and touching tributes dedicated to Father by the poets. And the tire manufacturers of this great and grand and glorious United States of ours. All right, Bill, all right, Bill. These great United States, <laughs> yes. including the Samoan Islands, the Hawaiian Islands, yes. the Philippine Islands. Yes, Bill, all the And the great I... sea would purchase now known as Alaska. All right, all right, Bill, all right. Okay. And the Eskimos. <laughs> we mustn't leave out the Eskimos, Don. No. You know, Don, there isn't one shower bath in the middle. Eskimo's igloo. <laughs> What's that got to do with Father's Day? I don't know. It somehow reminds me of my father. <laughs> Don, you remember this poem? Father, dear father, come home with me now. The clock in the steeple clangs one. At that time in the morning, father couldn't even get out of his chair, let alone go home. <laughs> oh, Bill, uh, Charlie has a poem about his father, too. Yes, I know it. Little by little, the acorn grew. Would have been much better if the squirrel had eaten the acorn instead of burying it. And uh, too steady. Oh, my. Yeah, once in the forest primeval, uh -huh. the murmuring pines and hemlock. Ah, the wood alcohol has gone to that kid's head. Two <laughs> quarts a day. Ah, restrain him. Restrain yourself, my diminutive little chum. This is Father's Day, and love permeates my bosom. Charles, my father, wrote a poem about your father. Woodman, woodman, spare that tree. <laughs> Touch not a single bough. In early youth it sheltered me, and now it holds me up. Oh, that's Very beautiful, funny. Bill. That's what, Don. Yes. But despite all of my father's remonstrations and pleadings, that was the day to cut down Charlie's father. Yes, they clipped him and they mowed him down. I have never seen my father, Mr. Fields. Oh, that's terrible. Go out and look in my woodshed. <laughs> Maybe there. Mr. Fields, could I call you Dan? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, Mr. Fields, huh? Uh, well, on second thought, Charles, you have paid me a great compliment, my little twig. <laughs> <laughs> I shall be your pudgy little dada. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Until the stroke of one or twelve, brother. Oh, that's fine. Yes. Oh, Pop. Mm, yes, my own little flesh and timber. 
<laughs> Say, Dad, uh, can you lend me five bucks? Ah, uh, here it comes. Can I use your new necktie tonight? Uh, uh, and, Dad, can I play with your loaded dice and your no. marked cards? You know. <laughs> I must deny you that, my dear son. I shall need those proclivities as I am attending the twice-speech. State pasty, that is the Ladies free patting and whisper. But, Father, wouldn't that be dishonest? Sir, you impugn my honor. Go away, or I'll drive a nail in your chest. <laughs> Say, Tally, I think you better go ahead with your poem. Yeah, uh, here it is. Uh, to Daddy. My father was a powerful man, Bob. Oh, stop him. Take him away. <laughs> My father was the president of a bank once, Don. Your father was really the president of a bank, Bill? Yes, he was. He had another Eskimo. Oh, wait, wait, Bill. Wait, another Eskimo and your father? Uh, perhaps I should have said my father and another Eskimo. All right, Bill, all right. Your father was president of the bank. Uh, well, he wasn't exactly the president, Don. He was a vice president. He was sort of a treasurer. Uh, he used, you, uh, he uh, swept out the bank, to tell you the truth. Oh, well, that's different. Uh, but he was a fine sweeper, Don. He was a clean sweeper, the best all-around the corner sweeper in the bank. Bill, Bill. Yeah. He and another fellow were cleaning out the bank one night. But the police officer, the union, uh, <laughs> somebody got after him for working overtime. Who said it? Oh, in Once the game. in the forest primeval. Filled with termites and boll weevil. <laughs> now, that'd be good there, wouldn't it, Don? Can't understand why the author left that one out. All the murmuring pines and the hemlocks. Father, dear father, come home with me now. I can see the little darling tugging at his shirt, uh, at his sleeve. Yeah. Bill, Bill, Bill. Clock to the steeple clangs, too. Yeah, bro. Clang, clang. Da, da, da. Clang, clang. Clang, clang. If I had a voice, I'd get in there. <laughs> Bill, Bill, the Father. clock in the steeple strikes two. Was, was your father still lost? Oh, no, Don. Father was never lost. Mother always knew where to find him. You'd look out the kitchen window and see him lying out there on the grass. <laughs> on the snow in the wintertime. I should say, children, your father has had a drink or two. We children could never tell. We thought Sticky was dead. Yeah, but, uh, Bill, you, you, were, you were telling me uh, what a powerful man your father was. Oh, yes, yes. Father was right up a very little chest, but his stomach expansion was about seven and a half feet. <laughs> Nine stomach, stomach muscles stuck out to here. Yeah? And it had a head like, shaped like a rocket for a cantaloupe. I don't know what's the matter up here. <laughs> was he? Was he? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't fit, but it's okay. <laughs> 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 now it's my chance. Two yeah. daddies. Oh, he's gone Once again. in the forest primeval... The father, dear father, come home with me now. now. Bill, Bill, please. The clock in the steeple clang free. Yeah. Clang, clang, clang. What is the sound I hear? The murmuring hemlocks. <laughs> jingle, jingle, jingle. The clock is uh, clocking. Jingle, jingle. What a smart boy. Thinks they ring sleigh bells in church steeple. <laughs> Bill, Bill, the clock in the steeple strikes three. What happens then? Ah, uh, that was a signal for Father to go home. Three strikes and Father was out. Oh. <laughs> you mean he went home, Bill? No, oh, he went out just like a light. <laughs> he was quite a remarkable man, wasn't he, Bill? Oh, yes, he was, Don. He was very dignified, too. I remember one day he was walking by a circus tent, minding his own business as usual, when a lady stuck a finger out through a hole in the dressing room tent, right into Papa's eye. <laughs> that was a cowardly thing for her to do, Bill. Oh, yes, it was, Don. <laughs> yes, it was. Pardon my levity. <laughs> Did your father stop to say anything to her? No, Don. He was always a gentleman. He kept right on going. He fell down three or four times. <laughs> Naturally. He used to do that to make the children laugh. <laughs> Finally, he staggered a trip. He walked walk through the swinging doors and right up to his room on the 16th floor of the Buster House. The Buster House? Yeah, the old Buster House, Don. It was later called the new Buster House and is now called the Buster House. Oh, <laughs> oh that's the place. Yeah, huh? all outside rooms. The sun streaming in day and night. Uh, wait a minute, Bill. Who ever heard of the sun streaming in at night? Midnight sun, Don. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Beg your pardon, Bill. Yeah. As I was telling you, Father just went to the circus. Yeah, go on, Bill. We know who sooner is 
removed his habiliments, setting clothing down. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Socks, shoes, button gaiters, shirts, and could I say undervestment? <laughs> or undergarment? No, no. Anyway, he took them off. <laughs> and his hat? Oh, no, he never took his hat off, Doc. <laughs> he usually slipped in his hat, peculiar habit, a light, sort of a fawn gray fedora with a little feather in the side. Looks very chipper, Don. <laughs> usually wore smoked glasses. And was very fond of smoked herring. Yes, 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 Bill. Very go on. Very fond of that. Yeah, go on. With mustard. Yes, uh, Bill, Bill, go on. English mustard. Uh, Bill, will you please go on? Funny how a man prefers strong mustard to mild mustard, Don. All right, Bill, all right. Your father got his clothes off and got into bed. Yeah, uh, with his hat on. Don't leave that out. Yes, he got that habit from Mother. She always slept with her shoes on. <laughs> Case of fire. Yeah, all, all right, Bill, all right. No sooner took his clothes off and got into bed with his hat on, the little general walked into the room. His father explained later, the general wasn't over a foot high, Don. Yeah. The little general looked at my father and he said, come on, boys, surround him. My father sneered. <laughs> and then he leered. Yeah. All right, continue, Bill. He never sneered without leering. Yeah. But, uh, Bill, what, what happened? Oh, yeah. Uh, was his mind alert? What a hair trigger brain. Yeah, well, what, what did your father do when the little general said surround him, boys? Oh, yeah. His father saw the little general in his corps of orderly. They all had whiskers. They called him the Flying Muscovite. What, uh, you mean, mean all these little now. generals only a foot high had whiskers, Bill? Right, yes, that's right, Don. There they stood with musket aimed surrounding my father, but father was unafraid. Unabashed. Undressed. Done everything. Oh, my father was in a tough spot, Bill. Well, what, what did father he do? Father threw a sheet over his head, completely confusing the army. And before the little general could say fire, my father jumped right over their heads and out of the window. Sixteen stories. The old brain was still working. <laughs> did your father jump right down to the sidewalk, Mr. Field? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> When he got to the fifth floor, he happened to think that he'd forgotten his life insurance policy. So he jumped right back to the 16th floor again. Uh, did he find it, Mr. Oh, Field? take him away, Edgar. He's full of sap. <laughs> father, dear father, come home with me now. Who said it? Once the, the clock and the people strike far. Clang, 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 what is the sound I hear? The ambulance is coming. Before the father stuff goes any farther, thank you, Edgar Burton, uh, and Charlie McCarthy, the and thank you very much, W.C. Speakers. Thanks for listening to 1937 Part 12, the Soundscapes Audio Montage Series Number 21. From When Radio Ruled, I'm Mike Gillette, your host. When Radio Ruled and the Soundscape series are before TV productions. Copyright 2022.